All right, greetings everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar. This webinar called COVID-19 Sex Chronicles. So I'm, are, I'm, I'm excited to I see Trina already got us hyped. Um, so this is going to be a great uh, webinar. We have um, amazing panelists. My name is Chioma Naji. I'm a program director at the Multicultural AIDS Co Coalition in Boston, Massachusetts. This webinar series is sponsored by the Multicultural AIDS Coalition, Black AIDS Institute, House of Blonick, Harvard University, CIFAR, and Southern AIDS Coalition. Um, we are a group of HIV advocates, researchers, providers who decide to come together to create a space um, for Black communities to talk about COVID-19 and all the complexities that it brings. Um, and so we use this as an opportunity to learn from what's happening in HIV and also to um, further build our understanding and our work um, that needs to happen collaboratively. At this moment, all of the participants, all of you are muted, um, but this is a interactive, engaging um, webinar. So we ask that you share all your thoughts, your ideas, your questions, use the chat box, um, use the Q&A feature um, that's a part of Zoom, um, and really engage with each other and engage with panelists. Uh, so we will be taking questions for the panelists um, as we move through our time together. As always, uh, we start our webinars with a grounding exercise. Uh, we find that this is very important um, to our collective uh, growth and, and our ability to find those moments to be still and also to support us in focusing on the conversation that we're gonna have today. Um, so I'm gonna ask Marla Stewart, if you can go ahead and ground us um, and please introduce yourself um, before you um, start. Hello, everyone. I am so happy and thrilled to be here, especially with all you beautiful other panelists. And um, thank you so much, Shioma, for inviting me. I am a sexologist, a sex coach, sex educator, and an author, speaker, and um, I do a bunch of other things, but I'm sure we'll get into that a little later. Um, but I really want to do this grounding exercise, and this is a grounding exercise that I do with um, my clients who particularly need to struggle or need to be focused. And it is a fun, uh, well, it's, I, I would say it's relaxing, but it's also a very sexual exercise. So I really want you to embrace your sexual side um, at the moment. And really, you know, we're, we're getting ready to talk about sex, y'all. So, uh, so what's more important than grounding ourselves in our sexuality? So what I want you to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through this first. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to close your eyes. You're going to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. We're going to take several breaths. The first breath is going to be shallow to the throat. The next breath is going to be to the heart. The next breath is going to be down to the stomach. And the next breath is going to be down to your genitals. Okay. Now you can use your hands either way. You can place your hands on your, you know, on your throat, on your heart, on your stomach, on your genitals, if you like. Um, otherwise, you can just put your feet, you know, resting on the ground um, and your hands in your lap. And last but not least, when we get to the genital breathing, we are going to do a pelvic floor exercise. So I want you to flex those pelvic floor muscles. And those are the muscles, uh, sometimes they're called Kegel exercises, but these are the muscles that we use to control um, when we pee, right? So I want you to flex those muscles that I'm gonna ask you to hold. So situate yourself, just get real comfortable real quick. Close your eyes. And I want you to breathe in through your nose, to your throat, out through your mouth. Next breath into the heart, breathe in, out through your mouth. Next breath into the stomach, out through the mouth.
Next breath, breathe in all the way to the genitals. Out through the mouth. Another breath down to the genitals. I'm gonna ask you to hold, keep holding, keep holding. Excel. Let's do that one more time. Breathe in all the way down to the genitals. Do the exercise and hold. Keep flexing. Keep holding. Exhale. You can open your eyes, sort of think about where you are in this space, and hopefully I've activated some, some good things there for you. So thank you all again for having me and for letting me ground you in that exercise. Thank you, Marla. Somebody said they real activated right now. <laughs> so, so we're ready for a good conversation then. <laughs> um, so as always, uh, we start our um, uh, conversations with uh, Dr. Priscilla Ojukutu, who is going to give us a clinical um, update. So okay. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Chioma and the other organizers for assembling such outstanding panelists. I really look forward to listening to um, the discussion uh, later on. I actually have to tell everyone that I'm at the hospital, so I wasn't able to relax as much as I should have. <laughs> but I'm going to do it again when I get home. <laughs> So as, as Chioma mentioned, um, at the beginning of these webinars, I provide a brief medical update. Um, we've talked over the course of these six or so, are we at number six at this point, um, webinars about manifestations or symptoms related to COVID-19. We've talked about like odd things that may happen to people like strokes. Um, we've talked about um, you know, transmission risk, all sorts of things. So today, I want to talk to you briefly about two issues that keep coming up as I talk to both, you know, patients as well as my colleagues and, and friends. Um, I want to say a few words about COVID-19 testing, and then I want to talk to you briefly about COVID-19 treatment. I want to talk to you about treatment specifically because I just saw a patient who was diagnosed with COVID-19, and I said, oh, well, we do have a treatment that we could offer you. And she said, what? I, I hadn't heard about that. Why are we not hearing about that? And by we, she meant us in the Black community. So I think it's important for us to know about these things, know their limitations, and be able to spread that information within our network. So let's start with, with, with testing. Okay, so everybody knows um, people go to get tested for COVID-19. You know, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, testing was very limited at first. It's now become more widespread. They're mobile vans, they're pop-up sites, and this is great. But right now, though testing is more widespread, we don't know as much about how many people are really getting tested by race and ethnicity. And of course, equity in terms of testing is, is very important. For those of you who have gone to get tested, that's great. For those of you who have not, that, that's fine. I think it's good to know what to expect. When you go, you'll see um, a healthcare provider who will be wearing you know, protective equipment. They'll take a pretty long thing that looks like a Q-tip, and they'll put it way to the back of your nose. Okay? If they don't put it way to the back of your nose, then it's probably not a good sample. So it, it's, it's slightly uncomfortable, but that's, it, it's really what's necessary. What they'll tell you is that turnaround time for most tests is several days. Um, a little bit more than that at some places, shorter than that at some of the hospitals where they, they're doing it on site. You know, I think that it's really important that you understand, and I know that I've gotten from a lot of my patients, is that if you test positive, somebody is going to call you in most places, okay? That's called contact tracing. Now, the reason why this is so important is because the person who's calling is going to ask you a lot about where you've been, who's been in your house, who lives with you, a lot of things that a lot of us don't want to necessarily tell people. <laughs> you know? It really does sort of make you feel somewhat uncomfortable. At least that's what I've heard from, from a lot of my patients. What I, I'd like to assure you is that this information is anonymous, okay? And the reason that they're doing this is, is actually really important. They want to take this information so that they can go to talk to other people who possibly have been exposed so that they can get them tested and kind of slow things down in terms of spread. 
So just understand that that is the process. And I think that that's really, really important for, for us, particularly given our mistrust of, um, of government, of systems, to get it that when we're going to get this call, somebody's going to be asking us a lot of questions. Okay, the second type of test that I want to mention is called antibody testing. Okay, now what does that mean? So it basically, it's not a, a nasal swab, so it's not that Q-tip thing that I mentioned, it's a blood test. And the blood test is looking for things called antibodies or proteins that are made by the immune system within our bodies when we're exposed to infection. The purpose of this test is to say, have you been exposed, have you had COVID-19 in the past? So you don't go and get this type of test if you're actively having symptoms, you get it to find out if you've had symptoms in the past. Now, this is a little bit problematic for two reasons. One, we're not really sure what this test means when it's positive, okay? So even when you have antibodies and they show up a few weeks after somebody is infected, we don't know if they're actually protecting you from getting COVID-19 again. We know that they provide some level of protection, but how much we just don't know, and we don't know how long that protection lasts. Literally, I had a patient who came to me, asked me to order these this antibody test because he wanted to know if he could go out there and continue to engage in, in, in his life, to have sex, you know? And that's, and that's, I understand that desire. I understand wanting to know that you feel protected and you're able to go, you know, have partners. But the reality is we, it's very difficult to truly interpret that test. Okay, so as it becomes more widely available, as we have more information, hopefully we'll be able to continue these webinars and we'll tell you more about it. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, as I mentioned, is, is COVID-19 treatment. So as I said, I admitted a patient. She was sort of slightly short of breath over the course of the next day. She became much more short of breath. And we went to her to talk about what we should do. So for most patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19, care and treatment is supportive. By supportive, it means we try to help you get you know, more oxygen. We try to help you, you know, stay, you know, uh, decrease your fever. We try to help you feel better. That's it. There's no pill, nothing. But for people who are more severely ill, like this patient, she became more severely ill, we do have a medication that sort of works. You know, I, I say everything, I like to be as transparent as possible. So it's called remdesivir. And for those of you who do HIV work, I know a lot of you all who are joining this webinar do HIV work. It's an antiviral agent. So in a similar way that we have antiretroviral therapy, it's an antiviral agent. But for remdesivir, what we know thus far is that it decreases the time to recovery for some patients. So instead of being sick for 15 days, maybe you're sick for 11 days. That's actually important for some patients, particularly those who are severely ill, but it's not what we do for every patient. I also want to say, and I think this is important, is that access is limited. You know, there isn't remdesivir everywhere, you know, and that's something that we need to continue to fight for because every treatment that comes out that we know has any impact should be available to everybody who needs it. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say for our medical minute, and I um, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Fasola. I mean, you know, one of the main points of, of having these webinars is to get accurate information out to our communities. Um, another point of having this webinar is that we can actually have authentic conversations, right? Um, and given the topic that we are going to explore today, sex, uh, given this topic, uh, we have certain guiding sort of principles in which we want to have this conversation. And so we ask that you um, are open to these guiding principles so that everybody feels safe in this space um, to have a conversation, all 233 of us to engage in a conversation around uh, COVID-19 sex chronicles. So those, what are, there are two principles that we're asking. One, this is our uncensored space, all right? So say what you think, what you feel, and say it however you want to say it, right? There's no judgment in this space. It's an uncensored space. Um, the other guiding principle is that we are uh, wanting this space to be sex positive. And what do we mean by sex positive is that we're open to um, any and all the ways in which people um, express their sexuality, um, express sort of their ways of affection and their own practices um, in terms of um, sex with, with their sexual partners, right? And so we want to create that space, have this space as being sex positive. Again, no judgment. Um, so if we're all down with that, if you're not down with those two principles, uh, maybe this conversation isn't for you because that's the way we're going to be riding for the next sort of um, hour or so. All right. 
Um, so let's get started. Let's jump in. Uh, we're going to jump in with, with asking participants three questions. All right. So I'm going to launch these questions and give you about a minute to answer these questions. And then we're going to have the panelists say a little something about um, what they see. The first question is, how has COVID-19 impacted your sex life? The second question is, are you having conversations about mitigating COVID-19 with your sexual partners? And the last question is, how are you learning to mitigate COVID-19 while having sex? And so you can answer those questions in the chat box if you're not able to see the questions on your screen. All right, I'm gonna give y'all 10 more seconds. All right. So if you see the results on the first question, how has COVID-19 impacted your sex life? 53% uh, said remain the same. Um, are you having conversations about mitigating COVID-19 with your sexual partners? 41% said yes. Um, and then the next was not applicable, 39%. The third question, how are you learning to mitigate COVID-19 while having sex? 43%, the majority said state and local health departments. Um, and the last one, have you been tested for COVID-19? And 74% of you all said no. So panelists, I'm gonna open the floor and ask for you to, if you haven't already, introduce yourself and please share sort of your reaction um, to those uh, results and, and share, you know, uh, any information you want to share with us about how you in your own life are mitigating um, COVID-19 as it relates to sexual um, uh, intimacy. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm honored to be on this conversation. Thank you, Yoma, uh, and Gary and Stefan for the kind invite. Um, I'm an associate professor at Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, but currently in upstate New York on unpaid leave due to some family issues. Uh, that COVID-19 ended up delaying a little bit longer than I thought. So my initial reaction for this was that I was really excited about the 4% that are having an increased sex life as a result of COVID-19. So yes, to you, Tony Michelle, you better do it. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm really, really, I'm really, really excited to hear that. But, you know, for me, I answered that decrease because not only am I not in Atlanta, but I'm also living in uh, my mother's house. So that by itself without COVID-19 would actually cause a little problems. Then when you add the stay at home and all this other stuff. Now, I think it's important to also note that that's a vague question. Your sex life can be a bunch of different things. So sex lives with other partners, intimacy with other partners, physical touch, yes, it has de decreased. Has it slowed down masturbation, fantasies, other things like that, hell to the not. So I would say when we're talking about that, then I would say it's increased. But I think most people probably read this and thought that it was more physical about this. Um, the other questions, I don't really have too much of a surprise at. I think people are having conversations, but it's not a majority. I think a lot of people are getting a lot of information from different sources. And it doesn't surprise me that two thirds of us have not been tested for COVID-19. I would actually include myself in that group because I just haven't. And I, you know, we're seeing a lot of stats and a lot of anecdotal stories with black people, especially going to their clinics or going to an ER and being turned away, not once, not twice, but three or four times, even when we have symptoms. So I think um, that's uh, something to discuss. So I wouldn't put that automatically on, well, black people aren't getting tested. I would say, well, there actually may be dynamics that people aren't testing black people because of bias or because of lack of testing or a combination thereof. So that's my initial reaction from, uh, from the answers there. Tony, Michelle, you wanna go next? Yes, I can. Um... Hey everybody, um, I'm Tony Michelle Williams, Executive Director of the Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative in Atlanta, AKA SNAPCO. And um, uh, definitely my sex life is, has increased uh, <laughs> with the, and with my primary partner, you know, uh, for folks who have to, or folks who chose to have quarantine buddies and families and groups of folks, um, you know, either you're leaning into those people or you're staying the hell away. And so I've been leaning in um, and enjoying intimacy, uh, close intimacy with my primary partner and friends um, in ways that I have not been able to do um, without being quarantined. Um, I also, you know, um, we all definitely have 
conversations about how we are keeping each other safe, whether it's, you know, who's coming to the house, who's not coming to the house, what house they've been in, all of the conversations, um, you know, are necessary. Um, and I, too, am not surprised about folks not being tested. Um, in Atlanta, we just have seen these pop-up places um, around um, to have access to, to testing. So I hope that that will increase for folks over the next few weeks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am Marla. I am, uh, like I said before, a sexologist. Velvet Lips is my company, sexuality education company. And I also run a sex down, the Sex Down South conference uh, in Atlanta uh, with my business partner, Tia. And I also teach at Clayton State University, which is about 20 minutes south of downtown Atlanta. And um, for me, um, my sex life definitely has not changed much. And actually, um, my wife and I, our lives have not changed much. Uh, she is an emergency worker, so she does actually, um, she is getting in touch with other people. And so um, we are, the way that we take precautions is, um, you know, her leaving her, you know, PPE, you know, outside or in the garage or in the laundry room. Um, and making sure that uh, before we even have any kind of interaction, she takes all of her <laughs> clothes off and then goes and takes a shower. And so, um, so that's the way that we have um, mitigated that sort of process around um, COVID. And um, I had my 40th birthday part party. It wasn't a party. It was a small gathering. <laughs> me and a couple of friends and uh so one of my friends um uh got tested and came over and another um couple of my friends were um just were just like we've been in the house we haven't been anywhere so um it was just like a, a trust thing just being like we you know y'all there were only you know it's only what like five of us in the place you know in the house so that felt pretty safe um, and yeah, so I'm also like, you know, David and Tony Michelle, not really surprised by the questions and the answers, um, because they are all definitely relatable. I have not been tested. I have not really been out of my house. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So until I feel ready to travel and things like that, I think that's probably when I would get tested. So. And Chioma, you're asking about testing. Somebody asked whether we're talking about antibody tests or the nasal swab test? Are we are we talking about both or what? That was specifically on the nasal swab test. Yes. Okay. All right. I think yeah, that's I th the one that has been uh, most sort of um, available. Someone someone was asking about the accuracy of that, and it is pretty accurate. Um, at least the nasal swab is it can detect it depending on how far down you go, um, and if the technician is actually doing it right. The antibody test is a completely different story. That blood test that uh, Basola was talking about in that some of those tests they found out that they only, they may have 50% false positives or 50% false negatives sometimes. So it really depends on the type of test that we're doing. But I think it's interesting because, you know, like we're talking about, like I think people are running out to get tested and then being like, oh, I can get my freak on depending on whether the test is or I'm safe because, you know, I'm, I'm positive for COVID-19. So you don't have to worry about getting nothing for me or I don't have to worry about getting nothing for you, I'm immune. And I think that that can give like a false sense of security with things. And I think it's gonna be everybody that's gonna to have to do stuff. And to make the comparison to HIV, like we talked about before uh, or yesterday, you know, Gary made the good point. There are a lot of parallels with HIV and COVID-19. Um, but, you know, the one thing that's different is that this is so much more infectious and easier to catch. So usually we tell people, well, if you protect yourself against HIV, you know, use a condom or be on PrEP, or if you're living with HIV, be undetectable for your partner, um, those kind of things. But with this, because it's, you know, respiratory secretions, you know, you could be eating somebody's ass. We found that studies, you know, the virus it actually is shedding in semen, as Marla mentioned yesterday, also it's shedding in fecal material. So you could eat somebody's ass, you could go down on somebody, regarding, regardless of whether it's female or male body parts that you're going down on, it's not gonna matter. Um, and so you are assuming a certain level of risk, but I'm, already, I'm always in the uh, frame of mind is you have to do what's comfortable for you. So try to get the best information you can, and that's hard to do at this point because there's different information coming out every day, some of it conflicts. 
Um, and everybody's still horny regardless. So it's kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do in this case? So I think you, you're almost like assuming a certain level of risk when you do stuff. Um, but I just don't want anyone who's watching this and anyone on this panel, none of us should be ashamed about going out, out and wanting to have sex and wanting to have touch and wanting to be intimate with somebody else just because somebody else says, well, I don't want to take that risk. Well, boo, if you don't want to take it, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I don't want to take it either. So I, I may weigh the balance, the pros and cons, and decide that I do want to feel somebody. I do want to get intimate with somebody, and that's okay. And I think one of the um, points that have been made by all of you are, is sort of what do we mean in terms of sex and what do we mean in terms of in intimacy? And it can look different. Um, and, you know, it could look different according to sort of, you know, our own wants and needs, right? And so I want to get into a conversation about, okay, you know, when we're talking about uh, the transmission of COVID-19, what exactly are we talking about? What are the fluids that we're talking about? And what are the ways in which we can reduce our risk doing those moments of intimacy? And I'm talking about intimacy in a very broad sense. One of the things I enjoyed that you said, Tony Michelle, was that, you know, I learned new ways to be with my partner. Like, that's amazing to me. Um, and so really unpacking uh, what are the ways that we can be with our partners that are different or what are the ways that we can um, really understand how we reduce our risk um, with COVID-19. So I want to offer that as a question to any of the panelists. I think, um, well, what I found fascinating is um, New York's uh, guidelines. So uh, the New York uh, City Health Department and their Safer Sex and Code COVID-19 uh, guidelines, which I think are absolutely brilliant. And they really showcase like, hey, you know, if you live with someone, it's probably okay to have sex with them, you know, or if you're going to have sex with strangers, like get into something kinky, make a wall between you all or like do all these different things. And so I really wish that um, other states would adopt um, something like this or, you know, give this guidance around or at least have it just to be known to a lot of people so that they can not only destigmatize something like kinky sex, um, but destigmatize like what it would mean to be intimately involved with someone, regardless if, you know, we are uh, diagnosed positive or not for COVID-19. Because I don't know about you, but I, when I was like posting on social media today, I was thinking about like, how many of y'all have had sex when you've been sick? Right? How many of you are like, I'm just going to push through. Like, I am just pushing through. <laughs> I am just going to work it out. And a lot of us have. And, you know, I have, my friends have, my colleagues have. I mean, I, I feel like a majority of us probably have. And so we need to really be realistic um, when it comes to what are we doing, you know, sexually and how, um, and, and, you know, and what are the things that we can, how, how do we make it kinky? How do we make it fun? And how do we, um, at the same time, also, you know, reduce the harm as well. Yeah, I was, I was going to add to that. Somebody was asking about what was that reference. And New York City Department of Health, their Twitter handle is at NYC Healthy. Or you can just Google um, New York City Health Department, Health and Human Hygiene, or I think Health and Mental Health Hygiene, something like that. And they'll have that on there, it's sexual health guidance. And it's just so amazing because the first thing they say is like, get into yourself. And then they say, if you can't get just into yourself and you want to have sex with other people, you know, do other things like uh, put on a mask. If you're wearing a mask and, you know, a lot of us will be wearing masks and have different things that we're doing while we're engaging in sex, that'll also offer you some protection. Get into what it means to touch somebody. If we think that it all has to be like a mouth or a genital part in somebody else, like try some of the different things where you're actually just touching somebody and testing for their erogenous zones and feeling somebody here or there and go into that. Um, Cause it always doesn't have to be a mouth or some kind of opening on some other kind of body part. So you can get into touch and really explore and whether it's just your quarantine bay, whether it's your wife or husband or partner, whoever it may be, or it's a casual partner that you're meeting on an app. It doesn't matter, but try to explore these different things. I think all of us are going to come out of this, a lot more in touch with who we are as sexual beings and have some new, you know, tools in our box to kind of move things forward and maybe discovering things, avenues of having sex that we didn't even think we enjoyed before, but now we're going to realize, oh shit, you know what, I actually enjoy doing this as well. So I think it's important to kind of push the envelope with that 
And uh, to Marla's point, the New York City Department of Health really did an amazing job. So I think it's up to other cities and states to jump on board with that. Yeah, I mean, I want to just mention sex toys um, as a way to um, continue to enjoy your partner or partners. So if folks can talk a little bit about maybe the different types of sex toys, what what are the different ways and in, in ways in which folks can use their sex sex toys, and also you know, there's still prevention around sex toys, right? So, you know, you want to wash before and wash after your sex toys, but that should be in general, right? Not just related to COVID-19, right? Tell me something, okay? So <laughs> if we can talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the sex toys that, that folks might um, be able to sort of play around with and get to know a little bit more. Wait, you're supposed to clean them? Is that, is that a... <laughs> A little bit, a, a little bit of soap and water, just a little bit. Termination now. Wait, right, right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, I, I, you know, thinking about sex toys, of course, you want to clean them, sanitize them. Uh, and also, you know, there's also the fun long distance toys, like for, you know, some of us who have long distance lovers or, you know, some, you know, whether, you know, you're in one place and your, you know, lover or spouse or whoever, your flirtationship, whatever is in another state or whatever, there's some really great uh, sex tech out there where you can buy a toy, have somebody control it with an app. Um, you know, so there's some really great stuff out there. It's just a matter of getting on the internet and licking and, um, you know, I, yeah. So if anybody has any questions around like that kind of stuff, they can email me later about that. I'm like, I don't know if I want to say any like name brands or anything like dropping anything, but, um, uh, so yeah, so sex toys, apps, making sure you're cleaning your toys. Um, and uh, honestly, there are just a lot of people who are not having sex too. Um, people who are in relationships who are figuring out who they married or who they're with and they're just like, oh, wait a minute, I have all this time and I just figured out who you are. Um, so there's a lot of that happening. I know I've, I've been seeing in my practice and, um, you know, so there's, there's a variety, I guess, of things going on, but that's, uh, maybe that's another topic. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, little off topic around. <laughs> I was just thinking what was on the forefront of my mind. Um, I want to uh, sort of change gears a little bit to talk about, I mean, we're talking very openly about sort of um, people freely being in sexual relationships and making very clear decisions about that. Um, but I think that, you know, we need to sort of look at also uh, what's happening in very particular communities, right? Um, I think, David, you brought up a little bit earlier sort of reasons why people are taking this risk. And those reasons could look different depending on um, the communities that we are talking about. Um, so Tony, I, um, Michelle, I wanna offer a, a question to you around some of the communities that you work with, uh, particularly the trans community. Um, what are the ways in which you are seeing um, conversations that need to happen or messaging that needs to happen for trans individuals who are engaging in sex work? Yeah, um, for sex workers, thank you for the question. For Black trans folks, um, for sex workers, particularly Black trans folks, you know, we oftentimes experience lots of isolation already, right? Um, on top of um, the, the feeling um, or the thought or knowing or vision of rejection um, and, um, and all of that trauma like in our bodies and so um i'm gonna come back to that but just really want to say that this has definitely been an opportunity for people to be more um uh in their work um or in, in their lives and relationships so uh, kind of what marla was um hinting to was that folks are just more self-reflective um around their needs um around their true desires that's not necessarily impacted by another person, but like that is like generating like from self. Um, and so definitely want to like uplift that. And I see you jamming Marla. So hopefully we can come back and loop you back in so we could jam because I think it's definitely relevant. Um, um, but for sex workers, you know, um, folks are hurting. We've been hurting for like a year and some change with SESTA and FOSTA. 
um, on top of COVID-19, pushing more folks to the margins. Um, more folks are, you know, experiencing homelessness in ways that they haven't before because for street sex workers who are living in hotel rooms, banking on $80 or $200 for survival for that day are not having access um, to the, the, those types of funds. Um, and so um, just wanted to like, just wanted to name that those are like the conditions. And then there are folks who are uh, thriving digitally. Um, and so for folks who um, have things like fans only or only fans, always only fans, come on, shout out to Beyonce, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the only fans and other, uh, you know, media platforms for uh, sex work or porn, um, there are folks who are thriving. Um, and again, the nuance of uh, trans people, uh, particularly who may not um, be perceived as trans, right, who have more access um, to those sites who, um, so, uh, sorry, my thoughts are getting everywhere, but um, so just naming the context in which trans folks are, are in right now. Um, but definitely want to go back and talk about um, safety in this context, too, um, and how being self-responsive and reflective um, is a part of how we are, um, a part of, you know, how we're regenerating safety for ourselves in the midst of all of the trauma that we're facing. So I was, like, reading through some of the things um, here in the chat. Some folks um, were texting, and there was one person who talked about um, how this, the kind of time of COVID feels like um, the times of HIV and like how that reminder for like elders, especially in our communities, like how that is triggering. And so like how, and for our youth, right, who are committed, like myself, who was, you know, 15 years old when my cousins were telling me, telling me that I would die, you know, from contracting HIV, um, like what it means in this time to make different decisions and to push myself through conversations with my partners so that I can again have, uh, be self-determined um, around my interactions and around my desires. Marla, jump on in, talk to me. No, I think what you said was really important too, is just around boundaries. You know, just a lot of people like not understanding their own boundaries. And now, like you said, being self-reflective and the boundaries are like, oh, holy shit. Like my boundaries are, 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 no, this is not what I want, or this is not how I want to live my life or whatever the case may be. So I think, um, no, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm loving all that you said. I think, you know, it, it, it comes down to boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, Tony, Michelle, you made a, a, such a great point about the stigma that it's related to HIV. And it's interesting because someone said in the chat, there's not really stigma associated with COVID-19. And I would actually argue against that because I had a very good friend who had symptoms and knew he was, he had had a, a, a relative who had died from COVID-19, some other potential exposures. And he was scared to go get a test. And he ended up getting the test and he turned out to be positive. Never had to be hospitalized, just isolating, he stayed at home. And I said, well, why were you scared about getting tested? And why were you scared to tell any of your family members, except for me, like he only told me. And he said, because I didn't want to be judged because people were going to think that I did something wrong and I was doing everything right. And I didn't want people to judge me. And I have to say, like, that shit is real that people are really going to be scared about that. Because when you give people prescriptive things that are going on. And when you live in a racialized society where it's usually every other ethnic group except for black people can make personal mistakes and not do something and not be blamed for it. Usually when black people are getting uh, more COVID-19 cases, people are saying, well, they're not wearing masks, masks or they're not listening. Even though you're seeing all these videos with white nationalists with guns running out with no masks, no nothing, and all the black protesters are all wearing masks and keeping our distance from folks. And so, People are scared because we've been conditioned to deal with the stigma of being blamed for something when we get it. And that very much harkens back to HIV. Well, what did you do to deserve this? If someone tests positive for HIV, well, you must have done something. You were being promiscuous or you were having sex without a condom and I'm going to judge you because of that. 
I think it's not exactly the same, but people are worried about the judgment. Um, and you know, stay away from me, don't touch me, don't come to my house, don't this, that, and the other. There is a lot of stigma that is driving people not wanting to get tested, or if they do get tested and find out they're positive, not tell anyone about it, just kind of rec you know, become more reclusive. And I think to Tony Michelle's point, like there's enough of us that are feeling very isolated and depressed and disconnected as it is, even before the stay at home orders. So you add that stuff into it and it just makes it really crazy for a lot of us. And you want us to have sex and intimacy within that context. That's when it gets really hard. Thank you. I mean, I think it's interesting for us to continue to talk about sort of the relationship between HIV and COVID-19, how there's some similarities, how it overlap and how, how it doesn't. Um, and, and in thinking along that line, I immediately go to sort of services that are available, right? Um, so what are sort of the services that are available to reach populations that we know are being highly impacted, not only by HIV, but now COVID-19 for some of the reasons that you all talked about. So how have you seen sexual um, health services being impacted um, and people um, not being able to access those services in the way that they were able to pre-COVID-19. Yeah, I can just kick off. I saw someone here say um, about uh, trans folks, um, trans women have always faced stigma. I think this was Sharice Moan. Now during this pandemic, healthcare is a barrier. Not that it's not there, but for us to go to an emergency room and to be rejected. And um, just to highlight, um, I think that is so important because even in real time on the ground, folks, um, trans folks in particular, you know, usually we take people to the doctor with us, whether it's another friend or, you know, who is, identifies as trans or someone or someone who's close near us. And we don't have that option right now. Um, uh, folks are being turned away at emergency rooms and moms, uh, uh, folks who are uh, pregnant are, um, you know, partners are not even to be allowed sometimes in like the room, in like labor and delivery rooms here in Atlanta, Emory um, to be specific, um, and the cap medical. And so I, so I just, um, it is definitely harder. Uh, for us to navigate confidently um, and powerfully those spaces in ways that, you know, we were kind of getting, a, you know, with media and with just so many messages around healthcare providers, their need to support um, uh, trans folks structurally in their practices and culturally. Um, now we're seeing just that, that big block and that big barrier of like not even to be able to have a physical person with us to support us in that process. Um, to also to to add to that, um, I just finished a, a research project, and there's a trans woman who um, was also having a hard time getting services um, because she was not HIV positive, right? So even like just trying to get services in general, you're not even HIV positive, and then on top of that, if you get COVID, like then what? Like you really just are are extremely isolated. So. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's troubling. I don't know what else to say besides that, you know? Yeah, yeah, services were already messed up before this. So this just make it, made it even worse. And I've had patients, I had a guy in the middle of March when the shutdown was happening and everything was really going crazy. He called me, he was a former patient of mine and called me because he was having a discharge. And he was afraid to actually go to the clinic because he was afraid he was going to get COVID-19 if he did it. So with a discharge, if anyone knows, you're worried about gonorrhea and chlamydia, and the best treatment is a shot and some pills. But the shot is kind of the main thing, and you have to physically go into a clinic to get that shot. And the second line treatment for that are, is just another pill instead of the shot. And I had to give him that. And at first it worked, but then he called me back a month later and said, well, you know, it went away for about a week, but then it didn't go away. And by that time, things had relaxed a little bit and clinics had kind of figured out how to get people there, how to keep the spacing, wear masks, have people sit in their cars, and then they would text them when they were ready to bring them in to kind of keep the spacing. And I had to literally convince him for like 15, 20 minutes on the phone, dude, you need to get this knocked out. And this is the best treatment. I said, I could try the old treatment again. I could try a different treatment. I could try a longer treatment of pills, but it's not going to be the gold standard, I said. And so... You need, and he was only like 22, 23 years old. And what I was proud of him for was that he kind of faced that fear 
He got his mask and he went over and he got all the care he deserved. They screened him for all the STIs and they gave him the treatment and they got him, they started a conversation and I had had him on prep before, but he fell out of care. And now he's getting back on prep because of that. And so sometimes it's one of those things where like, it's so internalized that we're used to this trauma and not dealing with this. And COVID-19 even makes that worse that we start to like judge ourselves. So we start to provide those barriers. And sometimes you just need somebody in your corner um, to say, hey, you know what, you do need to actually do this. And then sometimes you'll find that you'll have a good relationship or have a good experience at a clinic because the hundred ones before that were so awful and so shitty that you think it's gonna be like this all the time. But then when you find that one good experience that you can latch on to, um, it's not only good for your general health and getting treated, but also for accessing care later on. So um, it's, it's real, the obstacles and COVID-19 really presented a problem to us. There was a particular question that came from uh, one of the participants um, that I want to uh, get your all sort of feedback on. Um, the question is, do panelists have thoughts on people making pregnancy, contraception, family planning, sterilization plans during quarantine? Should people trust their reproductive health feelings during quarantine? What do you mean? Can you I may, maybe clarify around the reproductive health feelings? Like, what does that mean? Um, maybe the person can give more sort of um, thought um, in the chat, but I sort of took that as, you know, sort of uh, hesitation or concerns about engaging in reproductive health services because of COVID-19 um, and being able to sort of weigh the risk um, based on sort of what, where they are right now, and what they want to do right now um, in terms of their reproductive health. Yeah, so uh, I can speak to that. I had a couple of clients who actually gave birth during COVID-19 and decided to uh, have home births um, instead of go to the hospital. So I think there's that aspect of it. So the people who are, you know, pregnant um, and deciding to, you know, do the at-home birth, which then you find out, oh my gosh, we can do this. We can do this thing. We don't necessarily have to need a hospital for, um, which I think is absolutely fascinating because we were without hospitals, you know, 120 years ago, but it's neither here nor there. Um, but <laughs> but thinking about a reproductive health, um, and if we're trying to get pregnant, um, I personally can speak to this because um, I am currently in that process of, of trying to uh, go through the baby making process. And um, for me and a bunch of other people in my communities, um, they're still going at it. So there's still the safety precautions. I know uh, for me in particular, um, with, or for my wife and I, we, with our donor, you know, we've had to, we did the whole, you know, semen exchange with a mask, you know, in a public place, like, you know, all of those things. So I think um, people are still determined to, to get pregnant or um, have their reproductive choices um, regardless. And I think um, I even have a, a client who works at a, um, an abortion clinic and um, even, you know, the protests don't even stop there, right? So there are still people protesting outside of abortion clinics, which can also, um, you, you know, you're thinking about the stigma there too, but even though they have their masks and it, it, there's, just, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but people are, um, a lot of people are nervous. So a lot of people are pausing on their reproductive health choices and waiting until there is a vaccination. And then there's a lot of people who are just like, I can't wait. I'm going to I'm going to do this thing because we don't know, you know, what the case is, you know, what's going to happen in the future. So, yeah, and I, I think even during this time when people were staying at home, I think, you know, obviously, like you were talking about earlier, Marla, a lot of people were with their their partner or their significant other or with their quarantine base. So they'll be like okay, we're just going to light it up in the house since we can't get out. So let's do what we do. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, seven months from now, there's this big boom in like babies because people are actually starting to hear it. I, I think people are going to be a little bit scared. I think there's the component of people being scared because they don't want to access health in person um, for risk of getting COVID-19. But then there's also going to be the, well, I'm feeling so disconnected. And how do, what do we do when we feel disconnected and stressed and confused? Sex is a coping mechanism. Intimacy is a coping mechanism because when you feel distracted and disconnected from people, you want to feel somebody's touch. Um, you want to get to that level of intimacy. And I think that's a human thing. 
that a lot of people are going to be doing and we may see a lot of babies coming out of this which is a which is a good thing so and i think also people are scared of people are like do i really want to bring a baby into this world like especially not even covid-19 but the acute on chronic outbreak of racism that is suddenly opening up everyone's eyes like i think people are seriously thinking i don't want to bring a child into this world because this is some ugliness that we don't want to see and so i there's just so many human dynamics going on i don't think i've ever in my life lived through a period where it's been this much craziness to stress people out. And if I could just fast forward and throw this whole year away at some point, and can we just learn the lessons and just move on and just kind of throw 2020 in the trash and then the give, give me the lessons that I need to learn so I could just move forward. That would be great. Cause I know there's lessons I need to learn and I need to move forward, but can we just fast forward to December and start a new year? And then I'll, I'll incorporate the lessons then. <laughs> All right. I think, I mean, so funny, a lot I of think... what, oh, go ahead, Marla. Oh, that's so funny. So, uh, David, thinking about that, how there's such this, like, um, this this paradigm of, like, ah, throwing 2020 out the trash and, like, I don't want to bring any, you know, for me, it's like people are like, I don't, babies, well, how can we think about babies? And I'm like, we need more black babies. Like, what are you talking about? Like, we need it. We need more in the world. So <laughs> I feel, like, compelled almost to, like, I need to have all the black babies, you know, so. <laughs> right. What happened funny. to Tony Michelle? Where's she at? What happened? I don't know. She come, she come back and forth. She she got stuff going on. She's you know in the middle of it, Atlanta. So <laughs> Y'all know, I you know Atlanta is like holding strong today, right? <laughs> Y'all had a couple of shout outs, shout outs to the South. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's important, you know, for me definitely to to think strategically or intentional about HIV services. And particularly HIV testing, right? Um, I sit at a grassroots organization. Um, we're very much connected to a lot of the vulnerable communities. Whether we're talking about um, Black, um, gay, and bisexual men, we're talking about Black immigrants, we're talking about um, Black women who engage in, in sex work. We're talking about trans folks, um, and literally, we haven't been able to provide needed prevention services for at least a month, a month and a half, right? Um, and I immediately go to what, how is that going to impact what's happening, right? We're talking about folks are having sex, they're still having sex, folks are making decisions um, because of their work to have sex and making very uh, intentional um, um, decisions around their risk. Um, but what's going to happen three months from now? Are we going to see an increase in STIs? Um, and how is that going to impact our HIV organizations? Are we going to be in a position where we're able to do testing the same way? Um, so I would like to hear from you all in terms of um, what do you think is going to be the impact or uh, even now on HIV services are, you know, a month or two down the line um, in terms of HIV organizations and, and us seeing potentially a rise in, in STIs, um, not just, you know, our Black babies being born. <laughs> you know, I think um, it's a great question. And I think like every field, we're going to have to learn to change. And I think the HIV prevention and treatment field was already in an evolution because of the focus on biomedical advances, um, both for treatment and for prevention, to be honest. So I think what I've seen is that, you know, even with like policy around the CARES Act, had a certain amount of money that was being devoted to Ryan White clinics and other federally funded clinics, which was good to keep people in. But I think on a practical note, what we as providers and as the industry that does HIV prevention and treatment, we have to learn how to do stuff when we can't have someone physically come in the office. And we, we should have been thinking about this shit before. We should have been thinking about for people who don't have transportation, how can we do telemedicine better? How can we um, make sure that they get their medications that they need without forcing them to come in? How can we change the, the rules and regulations? Like for instance, for ADAP and stuff like that, where you have to have every six months, somebody filling out paperwork in order to get that in. And if you're only telling them that they need to be seen every four to six months, that's a pain in the ass for them to do that. So relaxing some of those will be helpful, improving telehealth services as well. Um, I think also too is a personal, uh, for the personal bias of a lot of providers. And I've seen this in a number of clinics where people will say, well, Mr. or Ms. So-and-so, you can't come in here to get your refill unless you get your repeat lab drawn. And they've been undetectable for years. They've been taking their meds. And even if they weren't, why are you gonna punish somebody? To me, it's, already, it's always made sense. I don't want you to fall off your HIV medications. 
So if you can't get into the clinic to get your physical blood work for a month or two, for whatever reason, I'm not gonna let your medications lapse and punish you because of that. I'm gonna make sure that you have enough to last you through that. Because I think what you do, if you punish people for that, that makes folks distrust the medical profession more. And then they're like, well, screw it. You don't care about me. You're willing for me to go off my medication. So fuck you. And I'm going to just move on. And we have to really be careful about that. So it's not only about the, the rules and regulations, the procedures, how things go, but it's also about provider attitudes, which quiet as it's kept, stank providers are the main reason why people don't go to clinics and why people don't access health care. It's not the money. It's not the transportation all the time. It's not that black people just distrust medical providers. It's that people are stank and judgmental and get a little bit on their high horse and all their bias comes out and that turns people off. And that's why people don't come. So I think if there's one thing the medical profession has to do right now is take a good hard look at itself, particularly with HIV prevention and treatment and say to themselves, what can we do to be better? Because obviously the profession wasn't listening before, it wasn't paying attention before. So maybe now in this moment, they'll pay attention to themselves and improve the way they deliver services rather than just blaming it on black communities that don't access services as much as they think they should. Any other thoughts? Marla, tell me, Michelle, about yeah, sort of I think David was right on point with the, the providers, you know, and their attitudes. Like you need people on the front line who are going to be non judgmental, and that is the key to being just be human be nice like shouldn't be that hard but uh oh we can't hear you oh, sorry about that people think people think it's something like well a black person has to have a black provider a trans person has to have a trans provider that's not the case we did we've done research before where we've asked black gay men do you, does it matter whether it's um a, a female a male a, a woman a man a gay straight trans what what do you want your provider to be? Does, is there a preference you had? And some people would say, yeah, I, I want someone to be another gay man, or I want it to be like, I want it to be a woman uh, because that'll remind me of my mama. Other people are like, I don't want it to be a woman because that'll remind me of my mama. So people were all over the map, but the one answer we heard the most was just be good. And so people don't want you to patronize or do some kind of statement, or you don't have to raise your fist in the air and say Black Lives Matter but you just have to treat them like you treat other members of your own family. Treat them as you would want to be treated when you walk into your doctor's office. That's all people ask for, is just connect with them on that level. Treat them like a human being, and everything else is going to be gravy after that. And then you can wax all the, the, the wonderful scientific and medical knowledge you have, but get into being a human being and treating your patients like human beings first. But because of all the racism and white supremacy in this country, a lot of people can't get over that personal bias. They don't just shed it when they get into these medical spaces. It goes on with them. And when they put that white coat on, it's still in there. And it still enacts on, these provi on, the, on the patients that come in. So it, be, it can be really problematic. I just think people need to work on being better providers, being better staff um, to the human beings that walk into your spaces. And a lot of, uh, and I think a lot of what we're talking about are the various ways in which our communities are negatively impacted or experiencing oppression, not only just individual, but also systemic, right? I mean, Tony Michelle talked about sort of, you know, what transphobia looks like, right? Um, you know, we can talk about what xenophobia looks like, you know, but how those, all of those inter interact with uh, racism, right? Um, and we know Kimberly uh, Crenshaw talks a lot about sort of intersectionality and how relevant it is even, I mean, it's very relevant to our populations, um, the ones that are most vulnerable to HIV. Um, you know, someone um, gave some suggestions for HIV organizations, sort of uh, what's happening in, in Philly, condoms can be sent by via mail, um, pharmacy prescriptions um, are being sent out. Um, I know in some places in New York, um, in other places, they're, fo they're focusing heavily on HIV home kits, so testing at home. Um, so I think there are ways that HIV organizations are being adaptive um, and are trying to be innovative and in serving the populations that we need. Um, I'll be great. I'll be interested to hear a little bit more about, particularly around prep. Um, and so, and David, I know that you have talked several times around sort of prep um, and the fact that individuals, particularly black, gay, and bisexual men are making decisions, made decisions to stop prep and are now getting back on prep. 
Um, so for providers who might be listening, um, what do you think are some, some considerations um, that providers need to be making, or even individuals who are making decisions like that around PrEP, um, what do you think um, are some of the messaging that we need to be putting out there? Yeah, I think, I think it just starts, like I said, started with treating people, everyone that walks in your door like a human being, um, not being uncomfortable with taking a sexual history um, and at letting the patient lead that. So not starting with, are you married? Or, you know, if it's, <laughs> if it's someone that gives you a, a male gender presentation, not to assume that they're either male gendered or, <laughs> or they're cisgendered or that they're straight, like you have to let go of some of these assumptions and just ask general questions are you sexually active and then start from there. And I think kind of staying away from the language that focuses on um, risk and pathology, because having sex is a pleasurable experience and the CDC always talks about their five Ps. And I, I've always told people this ever since I saw the five Ps, one of those Ps is not pleasure. And so I know Marla is probably thinking like those five Ps, like it, it should, the first piece should be pleasure. And that's what it should start off at. And then everything else is after that. But if you see, it's always about prevention, pregnancy, you know, partners, past STIs, all this other stuff. And I think it has to start with pleasure and then you can kind of do that. I did want to say, in addition to one of the, um, Chioma, some of the things that you mentioned providers are doing, one of the things that um, Damon Johnson, who works with the, uh, at Morehouse School of Medicine with the AIDS Education Training Center, he's the program, coordinator over there and just an amazing mind. He was able to get, and I don't know the name of this, um, of this program, but for the students, we were working in college and, you know, med school settings, there's a, you can get things in a locker. And so I don't know Marla or Tony Michelle, if you guys know about these as well, but there are lockers where you can prescribe things for students, whether it be condoms or whether it be medications or this, that, and the other. And it's very similar to the parcel pending lockers that people are getting their mail through where you have a kiosk and then you, you get an email or you get a text message saying your package has arrived and you get to do that. Um, and then the locker opens up and it's very private, it's confidential, it's just you and you're the only one that has that code. There are sexual health initiatives that use lockers like those. And so therefore- That's like, a, kind of, that's like the Amazon concept that you can- Yeah, just it's like an Amazon concept. And so I think we can, we can start to think out of the box about what to do especially with PrEP and other sexual health services, um, and making also doing more partnerships with pharmacists. People always forget about pharmacists and how important pharmacists are in the equation of healthcare provision, particularly with PrEP. Um, nurses, peer educators, everybody needs to be involved. And so if you have some innovative techniques that can reach out to people or you know, overcome the barriers of transportation or cost, some of those things, we need to think better, not only just telemedicine, but some of these things like lockers and other innovations, I think will be helpful moving forward. But it all starts with that one-on-one -on -one relationship. So if, you, if you're stank and that's your personality when you go to work, people are gonna sense that. And it, I don't care what the science is, I don't care how many vaccines or injectable prep or topical prep or whatever kind of form of prep you have, if you're stank, people aren't gonna wanna come see you to take advantage of that science. I think you yeah. just created a t-shirt if you stank. <laughs> Guarantee you, don't be stank. Stank. stank providers. Don't be stank. Don't be stank providers. <laughs> Marla, you supposed to say something? Yeah, there's one thing, David, that you are really speaking to, and I think it's just accessibility. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's something here that we could learn, you know, from disabled communities, from Black disabled communities who have um, been having issues or who have been able to navigate this world um, before it got to here, right? So um, that's one thing we, we need to be doing is, is you know, figuring out accessibility. Um, yeah, and I think Lisa, Lisa just commented in the chat box that her participants mentioned wanting mobile prep. And I do think it's interesting because those people that are old enough who are watching this and remember like the old school TV shows like Little House on the Prairie or Marcus Welby, where, you know, you had the little bag and you were making home visits. I do think there are going to be models or we will be forced to have models where it's not so much based on a patient physically coming into the clinic, but you're going to have a menu of services, almost like a restaurant and say, and when people come in for intake or whether they're video chatting on Zoom or FaceTime, the per, it's up to the provider and the staff to say, what's going to be the best option for you? Do you need us to come to you? Can you do this virtual health? 
Can you come in to visit us? Or is it going to be a combination of all of the above, depending on what your life circumstances are? So that way we're revolving the medical system around our patients' lives and giving them options that are flexible with how unpredictable life is, rather than saying, well, you need to come here and I don't care what you're going through in your life, what death you have in the family, what transportation issues, how you lost your job, how you don't have any money. We need you to come visit us. And if you don't come visit us, we're going to list you as non-compliant or non-adherent or not following up. And you're going to be judged after that. I think we need to look at ourselves and say, how can we improve the options for our patients to make it easier for them to access these services, especially when it's coming to the sexual health services, because those are so needed. So there are two questions that I want to make sure that we hit before um, we um, close our time today. One was the earlier question around how do you start these conversations with your sexual partners, right? Um, given the current sort of environment, environment we are in, how do you start those conversations about wanting to do something different, want to try something new, want to sort of check out the sex toy, um, want to, you know, Try something different in your um, sexual experience with your your partners, wherever your partners lie on the on the continuum. Um, so, if someone wants to answer that question, I know I personally would like to be interested in that question too. Tony's so. back, <laughs> right? <in the> bedroom. <laughs> Does it have to be in the bedroom? Don't do it in the bedroom. <laughs> do not have those conversations in the bedroom. Uh, <laughs> very important not to do it in the bedroom. Um, so if you want to introduce something new or different um, and say you have your partner is a little bit more maybe conservative than you are, then maybe you want to approach it as, you know, my friend such and such was thinking about this or I saw on this show and it fascinated me. What do you think about this? So do something that's really sort of neutral. Um, and if your partner is open or a lover is open, you could just say like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm really thinking about doing this thing. Um, you know, what do you think about it? Is that something that you would like to maybe engage in? And people just need to start the conversation, not in the bedroom. Start the conversation, you know, on the couch or over dinner or whatever the case may be. But don't, don't start it in the bedroom. And it's very much aligned with what we say in HIV, right? Like you don't start talking about we're going to use a condom, you know, like five seconds before everybody's hot and heavy. And you're like, let's talk about condoms. That ain't the way you do it. You know, you set sort of the way you want to have sex um, in, in sort of your safety zones um, before then. So that makes total sense, I, I think. Um, so I wanted to uh, move into sort of the last question. I'm just trying to check and make sure there wasn't any questions that we missed from participants. Oh, someone said to, you know, how can we address these concerns for people over 50 years of age? Um, these concerns, I, I'm assuming it's around sexual health concerns um, within, within this era, but um, what do you all think? I'm probably the only person on this panel over 50. I'm 51. So I want to say, yes, I need, <laughs> yes, we need these services. Um, but I think one of the bigger problems is that even before HIV, providers do not ask these questions for people who are older. And so the CDC recommends HIV testing between what, 13 and 64. The American Preventive Health Task Force Services recommends, I think, 15 to 65, something like that. It's almost like after 65, you're not having sex anymore. And we know in queer communities, once you turn 30, man, you over the hill, so you're not having sex anymore. So, you know, people aren't asking, or at least I'm not saying that's my belief. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at Tony Michelle like, ooh, that's not me. But people will say that, like, once somebody turns 30 or 40, people are asking about sex. And so medical providers, I think, are subject to the same bias. And so they don't ask. So I think when we're talking about sexual health, we need to retrain our medical communities and staff to say, look, Ask, don't ask questions just about hypertension and breast cancer screening and colon cancer screening and cholesterol and all that kind of stuff. Ask them how and with whom they're having sex um, because there's this assumption. And then they, if someone is living with HIV on top of that, 
they even put that on like, well, you probably shouldn't be having sex as much because you could transmit it to someone else. You're not having these sex positive sexual health conversations with people uh, who are over 50 or uh, particularly over 65, 70, 80 in those regions because people are just assuming that they're not having sex. And that's where I think we have to expand our minds to talk not only about the physical sex, but even if some parts aren't working, the other forms of intimacy that can give somebody sexual and emotional pleasure, I think is gonna be important. That may be a huge ask for the medical profession because sometimes they have trouble even asking just, are you having sex? Um, so I don't know, I think Marla needs to provide some, some training and maybe we can, get, we can get her to give some trainings to medical staff on like actually asking the questions and then diving in a little bit deeper. So to yes, speak. that has been a project of mine actually for a long time. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and actually, that is actually the theme for Sex Down South this year: sex through the ages. And so, one of our speakers is seventy-six and going to be talking about all the things. So, um, I think it's just really important that we have these intergenerational conversations around sex because our bodies change over time. You know, our bodies respond to different things over time. So, I think it's always, always important to. To have these conversations yeah for sure yeah there's a, lot, I, there's a lot of testimony happening in the in the chat i'm 66 i'm still doing it hallelujah <laughs> yes glory so, <laughs> yes I, I wanted to i wanted to add something to the question before that marla talked about um we we're talking about conversations and like how folks have the conversation and I just really wanted to offer, you know, when people offer with my work with transforming transphobia, particularly in black communities and within black folks, you know, um, there are a lot of people who actually have the conversation. What I have noticed, it is the moment before they enter the conversation that is hardest. And two more, the moment of the being present with their bodies throughout the conversation and how they hold what came out of that conversation, whether it's in their body through memory or you know through a touch or whatever, like after the conversation is had. And my just offering to folks is as you are approaching those conversations, holding those conversations, just remember to breathe. Just remember to breathe. Marla took us through a cute little set. Even if you get down to your genitals and be like, oh, this is why I'm asking. This is why I'm asking. Go ahead and breathe the breath through all of those places in your body. Um, but take a deep breath and, and, and do a quick body scan, right? Really take a moment to notice what sensations are coming up. Like, where anxiety is happening in your body, what stories are coming up that's preventing you from holding uh, the conversation um, or even being present in those conversations or even being connected to your partners in those com or whoever you're having those conversations with. Like, um, but just do a body scan to just be f get familiar with how you're showing up in those conversations because it's actually that one conversation is actually maybe just for that moment, but it's important that you know how worthy you are of the things that you desire and long for. And you're going to have to continue. Like you want to build a body that can hold whatever conversation needs to have with whoever, right? You're having that conversation. So whether this partner don't want to touch you in this way, you still want to have the body and the capacity to ask the next one right? Because it's to remind yourself that you are worthy of having that conversation. So just continue to breathe, do a body scan so that you can build a body that can hold that. I think that's I like that. And You know, and I will add, you know, as part of that conversation, um, being okay with walking away. If it ain't working for you, if you ain't getting what you need, um, <laughs> if they're not willing to keep you safe in the way that you want to keep be kept safe, be willing to walk away because it's all right. Like you said, Sound. you go and have that conversation with the next one. Yeah. Sound. Thank you for sharing that. So we're gonna close this off with with the question with a question, and I feel like this is like the ultimate. This is the elephant in the room. 
Um, and I want to, you know, give space for each one of you to um, answer this question. Um, and really given the current uh, COVID pandemic um, and that fact that, that states are reopening um, and some states are, are, are reporting uh, resurgence um, in cases, um, can we really go back to sex as it was before? Derek Cox, hell yeah! I mean, think, just <laughs> reflecting on the poll earlier, people are still having the same sex. It's not, it hasn't changed. So I think that's a, a pretty accurate reflection of like, of what's probably in, the, in our future, right? Where we, we, we go to what we know, right? We go to what's comfortable. And um, I, I think that you know, maybe some things will change, um, but I, I really think that it, it might, it might stay the same, you know. I don't, I don't know whether it'll change per se, because I, I think the one thing with COVID-19 is that we've had to get more comfortable with saying we don't know about a lot of shit. So I'm very comfortable with saying I don't know, because I think for some people, sex will get better. For some people, sex may get worse and they may be more anxious about it. And for some, it may be just the same. They'll be like, no skin off my back, I'm good. And then we don't know what the future holds with regards to treatments, vaccines, how after all these different waves happen, how it ends up kind of playing out in our communities. So I just think we have to be open. The best thing, the, the way that I would answer that question, we just have to be open to the possibilities. Um, and I think, you know, we all use the word boundaries a little bit earlier. And I think that's a good word. Not only your boundaries as far as your safe space, but also kind of pushing the boundaries on what you considered sex or sexual or what turned you on before. And you may find some things that you didn't think turned you on in the past now turns you on. So just to be open to that as you kind of move forward um, past this epidemic, because a lot of the scientists will say that they think that, you know, this new coronavirus will be with us for a while. So it's not going to just hit us like this and then go away. It'll be with us on a low level scale, but we'll be able to control it. It's not gonna be all the craziness that we've had these past three months. So I think as far as like peacefully coexisting it and still being the badass sexual beings we are and embracing that and enjoying that is going to be the challenge in front of that. And that's gonna look different for a whole lot of other people. So this ain't gonna be a cookie cutter response. So whatever's gonna work for you, just as long as you're being safe for yourself um, and being comfortable with what kind of sex you have and um, I think we all have a lot to learn. Moving. All right. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed uh, hanging with y'all and having this conversation. Um, I've seen some amazing comments, folks really uh, giving a lot of shout outs to what you all are saying. Um, so thank you for being with us today and sharing this space with us. Um, we will be doing our next webinar in two weeks. So please look out for information about that webinar. Um, I'm gonna give some time, Marla, if you can um, put in some of your, con your contact information, David and Tony Mitchell, several folks are asking, wanting to co um, connect to um, all three of you all. Um, so please put your information in the chat box. Um, and thank you. We'll see everybody again, hopefully in two weeks for our next webinar on Black communities and COVID-19.